Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Thursday, June 18th, 2015. Here's a quick look what's coming up. Tonight, a coward with a gun murders a church congregation. Who is Dylan Roof? And where did he come from? And the TPA passes the House and heads back to the Senate. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm more just in grieving for myself and the country and all of us because we're in deep crap. I mean, I mean, we're in the hands of some really bad people. And, we've been so and we begin this evening with the tragic and cowardly church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina, where nine people, including the church pastor, were shot down and murdered in cold blood. The suspect has been caught and he is currently in custody in a North Carolina jail. Charleston police have released photos of the suspect accused of the mass shooting. There he is right there, 21-year-old Dylan Roof of Lexington, South Carolina. The victims of the shootings were six females and three males, and apparently the gunman was right there with them attending the church at the time. That's right, he was actually there with the victims during a Bible study so he didn't just walk in and start shooting people. He was there with them the whole time before he suddenly began to open fire and execute everyone. So a very disturbing and shocking tragedy indeed. The liberals are already calling for an immediate gun ban. And wouldn't you know it, right on cue, within hours of the shooting, the Obama administration or Obama himself actually had a press conference and he is exploiting this tragedy for gun control and racial division. Once again, innocent people were killed in part because someone who wanted to inflict harm had no trouble getting their hands on a gun. Now is the time for mourning and for healing. But let's be clear. At some point, we as a country will have to reckon with the fact that this type of mass violence does not happen in other advanced countries. It doesn't happen it's not in true. other places with this kind of frequency. Nope, not with guns, but with baseball bats and knives, higher. And it is in our power to do something about it. England has three times the violent crime rate in the U.S. I say that recognizing the politics in this town, uh, foreclose a lot of those avenues right now. This is live. But it'd be wrong for us not to acknowledge it. Within hours of it happening, and at some nine point dead, the be president is out addressing it to hype it. Come to grips with it. Yeah, come to grips. With you giving Trust weapons to Al-Qaeda in, in, in Libya and Syria and Egypt to kill hundreds of thousands, the issue of gun violence collectively. And, and missiles to them? The fact that uh, this took place uh, in a black church uh, obviously also raises questions about a dark part of our history. Uh, this is not the first time that black churches have been attacked. And we know that hatred across uh, races and faiths pose a particular threat to our democracy and our ideals. The good news is I am confident that uh, the Folks, this is it. They've been hyping race war, pushing it as hard as they can, saying the NRA is the new KKK, even though the NRA was founded in part, 50-50, to arm blacks in the South who were being disarmed. In fact, there were calls by liberal groups to disarm whites particularly today, and I just want to point out that that's been done before, but to blacks. In the South, the first gun laws were against blacks. And then when blacks migrated north to Chicago, New York, and D.C., they passed the most draconian laws in the country to disarm blacks. And that's why what you've got, last number I saw was 14 blacks a week are being shot almost exclusively by other blacks and killed in Chicago. You're not going to see a press conference from the president on that or on the 51% of blacks that were never born. You're going to hear them now say gun ownership, as Michael Moore has been saying, gun ownership is about racist white people. And you go, that doesn't make sense. What's it do with race? They're going to push it now. You see, it's not about the, the killer, the alleged killer, killing people. 
whether you used a bomb or a truck or whatever. No, it's the gun did it, and if you've got guns, you want to kill black people. No, the answer is, if I was a black senator especially, or a senator, period, and I gave speeches in public, you better bet your bottom dollar I'd be carrying a concealed handgun. But see, folks don't carry their guns to church, and they should. Let's go back to the president. Can't believe I'm saying he's the president, the traitor in chief. Members of their own communities, but to all in need. They opened their doors to strangers who might enter a church in search of healing or redemption. Mother Emanuel Church and his congregation have risen before. He is so from upset right now. He cares so much earthquake, about black people. Mother Dark Times. That's to why they've hope to doubled the so unemployment rate of blacks in seven years. And with our prayers and our love and the buoyancy of hope, it will rise again now as a place of peace. And with us now is David Knight. And David, this is all too predictable by the Obama administration and the left to use this tragedy to, as an excuse to disarm the American people, not only to disarm us, but to further divide us. Absolutely, they always use a crisis. They've said that many times. And of course, there's other things going on that I think shed light on why they would wanna have a race war. Of course, we've got the financial situation that's unfolding in Europe mm -hmm. uh, with Greece. Looks like uh, that that's a major situation there, as well as these secret trade uh, treaties that are being negotiated. Which you're not going to hear today. too much about the next couple days, by the way, because all right. the media attention is going to be on this shooting. Nobody paid any attention to the fact that Fast Track was approved by the House of Representatives today. Now, it has mm -hmm. to go back to the Senate because they approved it contingent on uh, this unemployment bill. Of course, they know that it's going to cause massive unemployment. So they said, all right, we'll throw a bone to you. We'll give you some temporary extensions to this. And, and, uh, uh, that was a condition in the Senate that's been taken off in the House so that has to be renegotiated. But of course, as you pointed out, this is really about setting up a race war. Yes. And we saw how this played out 22 years ago in South Africa. As I talked to uh, Alex Jones earlier today mm -hmm. about it. And of course, in that situation, it was a uh, white minority that was trying to hang on to power. You had a, uh, a black majority that was coming in to power. A lot of people didn't want to see apartheid go away. They didn't want to see white minority rule go away. So as a last resort, they were willing to pull the trigger on a race war. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what happened at this St. James uh, shooting that we talked about earlier today, where you had a church of a thousand people. First time that happened in a white suburb, a thousand people. They had five black gunmen come in with AK-47s, lobbing in hand grenades, shooting people. Ten people died. Fifty-three were wounded. Massive attack. Mm -hmm. What stopped it was a man with a gun. One man with a thirty-eight was carrying a gun. And he shot back. At that point, they fled. They had uh, Molotov cocktails that they were prepared to use. They were going to use that against the crowd. They were going to burn that church down with a thousand people in it. And of course, interestingly, initial police reports said there were also two white gunmen with the five black gunmen. But then they changed it so they could have a black versus white narrative because that would push forward their race war narrative. Well, absolutely. And and going back to the gun shooting here, you know, this is very provocative because. Black churches have been targeted in the past. It reminds me of the church bombings in, in the 60s and the early 70s mm -hmm. here in America. And, and there's some bomb threats today. They're and there's just, bomb threats today. Yeah. By the way, I was going to point out that some of those church bombings back in the 60s and 70s were carried out by Obama's friends in the weather underground, you know. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. but this yeah. is very, very yeah. dangerous because there is a lot of racial tension going on right now. Of course, the Obama administration is there to throw fuel on the fire, but... I think, what do you think? How are they going to use this tragedy, obviously, to further escalate racial tensions, but could it lead to civil war? Because not everyone's going to give up their guns so easily. Yeah, you know, they, they, they take something, a school shooting, for example, is something that, that really hits people at a visceral level, mm -hmm. okay? When somebody goes into a prayer meeting and sits there for an hour praying with people, they're talking about God, Jesus, the Bible, and then he stands up and starts killing people and then tells somebody, leaves a message, to make sure this gets out. And then today we've got these bomb threats, three of them, one of them in the, in the courthouse where they've got the media gathered and, and two more at churches that were having vigils. And of course, anybody can call in a bomb threat. Mm -hmm. So anyone who wants to escalate this into a race war can do that. It's very easy to do that. It takes a lot to push back and to get people to understand that's not where we want to go. That's not the, the path that we want to follow. That's right. And Joseph P. Riley Jr., the longtime 
Democrat mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, well, he's already blaming the Second Amendment. And he says there's far too many guns out there and there needs to be a major national effort for gun control. And of course, he's not alone. His voice is basically echoed throughout the entire left. Representative Wendell Gilliard, a Democrat whose district includes the church where the shooting took place, he said, we need action. There's a race problem in our country. There's a gun problem in our country. We need to act on them quickly. So they are moving very fast right now to link racism with gun violence. Leftists pounced on the Charleston shooting before the bodies were even cold to push their twin agenda of gun control and racial division. Liberals are hastily exploiting this tragic incident to fabricate the myth that there are armies of white people waiting to commit violent hate crimes against blacks. They're even advocating that only white people be disarmed, an inverse of early racist gun control laws which targeted black people. The reality is somewhat different. Here's what they're not telling you. There's no wave of hate crimes being committed by whites against black people. Justice Department figures show that black people comprise 13% of hate crime victims, a figure in line with their population numbers. White people, on the other hand, comprise 65% of hate crime victims. And from 2003 to 2006, Black people comprise just 7% of hate crime victims. Black people are responsible for half of all homicides within the United States, despite making up only 13% of the population. Department of Justice statistics show that between 1980 and 2008, blacks committed 52% of homicides, compared to 45% of homicides committed by whites. There's clearly a problem of violent criminality within the black community, but hardly anyone is talking about it. Despite being outnumbered by whites five to one, blacks commit eight times more crimes against whites than vice versa, according to FBI statistics. A black male is 40 times more likely to assault a white person than the reverse. Incidents involving hate crimes, including murders, where the perpetrator is black and the victim is white, are almost universally ignored by the mainstream media. For years, the phenomenon of overwhelmingly black people randomly attacking white people on the street was disguised by the press, calling it the knockout game, when in reality it represented a disturbing wave of violent black on white hate crime. And once again, we're seeing this dumb argument made by liberals who claim that the Charleston shooting isn't being called an act of terrorism simply because the perpetrator is white. They seem to be incapable of visiting dictionary.com and finding out that terrorism means to use violence to coerce for political purposes, particularly targeting institutions of government. Newsflash, when white guys commit acts of terror which are politically motivated, they are labeled terrorists. Bill Ayers, Ted Kaczynski, Timothy McVeigh, Eric Robert Rudolph, they were all denounced as terrorists. When Ishmael Abdullah Brinsley shot two NYPD cops in the head last December in a Black Lives Matter revenge attack, which was clearly politically motivated, he wasn't called a terrorist. So by that benchmark, neither should the Charleston shooter. Many on the left even demanded that the German wing suicide pilot be labeled a terrorist simply because he was white, when that incident had zero political motivation whatsoever. Same thing with the Chapel Hill shooting. Just like the NYPD shooting, racial division, fueled by the Black Lives Matter movement, in coordination with the Obama Justice Department on one side and white supremacists on the other side who hide behind racism to ignore the very real problem of police brutality meant that the Charleston shooting was all too predictable. Should law-abiding blacks be made to feel guilty for disproportionately high black homicide rates? No, but by the same token, law-abiding whites should not be figuratively put on trial and pressured to atone for their white guilt and relinquish their Second Amendment rights in response to events like the Charleston shooting. So long as the debate continues to be centered around hating on and shaming people for their skin color, resentment on both sides will continue to boil over, 
encouraging mentally disturbed people to violently act out, with more innocent victims being the price we pay for our obsession with race. Check out the other videos, subscribe to the channel. I'm Paul Joseph Watson for Infowars.com. It appears to me that he was uh, coerced, that this is where that jargon, for what I understand he was saying inside the church, is typical old clan language to entice white men to join the clan. But it's like almost like overkill, like they were giving him what to say so it would be directed towards the clan. I mean, it was kind of weird to me hearing some of the comments that he made before he allowed this one young lady uh, to live. But uh, why is, and once again, South Carolina. Now, you now, you know, out of all the police issues, the one involving Walter Scott was the most blatant, and now you have this incident. South Carolina really is going to have to call home the church, call on his faith. There must be peace. And, of course, Al Sharpton and Jesse are already there. I don't know really how this is all going to turn out, but it is, as you say, someone unquestionably, systemically, is trying to cause race indifference, race war. I'm just going to be plain and simple. And um, if I would have picked all the states to do it, I would have had to say when I thought about it, yes, yeah, South Carolina, because they should have been reeling from the Walter Scott situation. Now you have this young man picking a historical black church, one with a history, one with a state senator. And you're right, a state senator in these times and days needs to know he, he has to be armed. He has to be able to protect himself or have someone there. And you pick that particular historical black uh, institution, that site, which we understand, uh, I think my wife just told me that it's also been uh, defined by the state as historical, is obviously textbook. I think they feel, because of the tensions already, that people won't look uh, and to see, indeed, that this is some type of subterfuge by those who sit in high places. Let's, let's, let's face it, they're the only ones that can pull this off. But um, that language certainly was a tip-off. Uh, the fact that they would leave someone there, you know, it's almost that that was the instructions for him to do. This is the way you do this. Now, if he's really smart, nobody walks out, <laughs> okay? But if if he's been basically coerced or constrained to do this. Uh, obviously, he is a guinea pig or he's the scapegoat for something a lot bigger. This is done just before the Juneteenth or Juneteenth celebrations this weekend. Oh, yeah. You will have oh. across the nation African-Americans gathering together for Black Pride uh, a lot of it is basically uh, some of it to blame the established order for our issues and problems. But um, they're going to be gathering. I'm going to skip this break. It's too important. I'm sorry. Last break I'm skipping, but uh, please continue. This is bombshell. So everybody gets together, gets motivated, and then is directed by Obama, go after the guns. So all take right. the tragedy, take all the, the pain, the whole history of abuse, and then fuse it in as a weapon of anti-gun. It's genius. It's perfect timing. Yeah. Well, well, yes, I hate to say it's evil genius, but it's genius because you have some of these speakers at these rallies that are basically, let's face it, I'm an African-American. They hate America. And they will take this. This will be the topic of every speech and every celebration across wow. America. Ten white people have been shot dead in a church by black gunmen. No, I didn't get it wrong. That actually happened back in 1993 in South Africa. And there was a political dimension to it as well. And when we look at this shooting that just happened in South Carolina, we should remember that even if this guy is just a lone, crazy racist, this can still be used as a false flag. Going back to this situation back in 1993, what we can learn about that today that universally applies to everyone, whether they're white or black, whether they're in a school, whether they're in a church or not, back in this particular case, we had 500 gunmen burst into a church in Cape Town suburb during a service last night and opened fire, killing at least 10, wounding 53. There were 1,000 people in the church. They had AK-47s. They had hand grenades. They said all five were black. However, if you look at this story from The Independent at the time that it came out, down here at the end it says that uh, initial reports indicated that two white men had been among the five who attacked the church. 
The police later retracted that and declared that all the attackers had been black. Now, the interesting context of this that was going on politically, of course, was this is the time they were transitioning from minority white rule to majority black rule. There was a lot of tension, racial tension going on there. This was designed, I believe, to inflame racial tension at the time. And it may have been a false flag from the very beginning with these five black men being joined by these two white gunmen, then making it all about a black versus white. But you go ahead to talk about how uh, white South Africans were already jittery and uncertain enough at the prospect of democracy and black rule. Let's take a look at these last two events. Both of them happened just within the last couple of months, both in Dallas. Here's one. Gunmen killed at Dallas event. This is, of course, the Prophet Muhammad cartoons. Then this one right here, we just had uh, just last week, gunmen dead after firing on Dallas police outside headquarters. Nobody died in these cases but the gunmen because they had people who were armed there to protect people. That's what needs to happen at the churches. So we see that at this particular time, we have a, a racial tensions that are being flamed in this country. Whenever there's a uh, ambiguous shooting of a uh, excessive force or a police shooting, they always seize on that. They ignore the ones that are clearly uh, excessive use of force. They talk about the ones where they can spin it into a black versus white narrative. The key thing, too, to take away from this, and of course, uh, people that had survived this particular shooting went on tour and talked to other churches and said, make sure you have someone in your church or multiple people in your church that are carrying concealed. Otherwise, you are creating a victim disarmament zone. You will have victims if that happens. And we need to understand that churches, like schools, are places where people are very vulnerable. They let their guard down. And you, also, you not only have a racial dimension to this, but you also have a religious dimension to this. We could have a Muslim attack against white, uh, against uh, Christians, or Christians against Muslims. We need to make sure that we protect ourselves. The Second Amendment is the way we protect ourselves. The Second Amendment is not the problem. Going back to the South African shooting, one of the things that we need to understand as we move forward with this and try to keep this kind of tragedy from happening again, one man was armed in that congregation of a thousand. He had a 38 pistol. He shot back at the attackers and they fled at that point. They later testified that they had Molotov cocktails loaded and ready to go. They were going to burn down this entire church of a thousand people and they didn't because one man shot back. And of course, this man now is going around talking about that particular event, Carl Van Wick. He also has a uh, book that you can buy called Shooting Back, The Right and the Duty of self-defense. That is the lesson that we need to understand. That is what we need to take forward with this to protect people, to keep this tragedy from happening again. We also need to make sure that the media doesn't turn this into a race war, the media and the politicians. That would be a great tragedy as well. One thing that I think is clear with young people and with adults as well is that we just have to be repetitive about this. It's not enough to simply have a, a catchy ad on a Monday and then only do it every Monday. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. Let's understand that. Certainly Frederick Douglass did. As you can see from this quote that's up on the uh, Infowars.com website today, a man's rights rest in three boxes, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. That was Frederick Douglass, a former slave who got his freedom, and he didn't want to be anybody's slave. And one of the ways that you make sure that happens is to make sure you can protect yourself. For InfoWars.com, I'm David Knight. Um, what's your overall first assumption, and are you surprised we've confirmed that he was on a, a psychotropic-style drug? Oh, not at all. When we talk about these drugs that I mean, these people were on, uh, myself and Kid Daniels, we went to Fort Hood after this most recent shooting, and Kid asked the general, he said, was this guy on any type of drugs? And he answered him flat out and said yes. So we see this time and time again, these people who take these uh, mind-altering drugs that are supposed to help you, but to anybody who had watched these commercials, Alex, they see in the fine print when the guy tries to speak real fast, this could, uh, you stop taking this drug immediately if you have any thoughts of suicide or violence towards others or something to that effect. So that does not surprise me at all. Now, as far as, as far as the actions of this individual, Mr. Roof, well, I shouldn't call him Mr. Roof, of uh, going to this church and killing these people. He looks know. whacked out of his brain. Yeah, I mean, you can take one look at this guy. They have mug shots of him. They have, I guess, Facebook pictures of wherever these pictures come from. And he definitely looks like he's on another planet. You know, he's he has this blank stare. 
this weird haircut. The guy looks like something's wrong with him. And to, to see this, it's very horrible. But to anybody who would say, let's immediately take away the guns, I was telling you off air, Alex, that I had an uncle, you know, he's passed away now. But back when we had a church up in Michigan, if he wasn't packing, he made sure that the person watching the door had the heat on him. You know, and, and it wasn't, you know, some obtruse thing. It wasn't, you know, very pushy. You no, know, he's just politely answering the door, opening the door. Hey, come on in. And he just had a, you know, a Glock or whatever he had. Because somebody might come looking for somebody they want to shoot at the church. Yeah. Or it might be a crazy. Yeah, somebody who just wants to go in there and kick up stuff. But that's the reason why you have an armed society, so you can defend yourself. And this is no way of knocking the police, but just this most recent incident, dialing 911 did not save the people in this building. That's why you need to have the ability to defend yourself. And we think about the shootings that happened recently right here in Dallas, also this past Thanksgiving here in Austin. And, yeah, the guy goes to a hard target, a police station. He's able to fire off rounds in both of these cases, but the police take him down. Why? Because the police are armed. They can respond. They don't have to dial 911. They are 911. That's why you need to be your own 911 and have the ability to defend yourself. That's right. Charles Black Charleston Church should have been its own 911. They should have been armed. Uh, 911 didn't save the victims at Charleston. There's your headline. I mean, we have, we're in a culture war, folks, a war for individual liberty. What do you think, and I want to go to Reverend Childress and stay with us, Shikari, uh, for your analysis. What do you think of the instant attempt to claim that guns are now somehow racist? Well, you know, they always blame guns, whether it's, you know, the L.A. Times or when the uh, Elliot Roger case happened briefly or recently. And, you know, he had a knife, he used a car, but just the simple fact that he used a gun, we have to ban all the guns. It wasn't let's ban the cars, let's go ban the knives. And now when we're talking about the uh, simple act of owning a firearm as racist, it's nothing new, but it's very inaccurate. You know, because regardless of what they may be doing today, the NRA was founded to help minorities learn how to shoot. And a lot of people forget that. They say the NRA is the KKK, which cannot be further than the, from the truth. And, and they know that when they say that on Fox Sports and CNN. Let's not forget, R Rupert Murdoch has these messages on his other platforms. Fox News, he has just to control conservatives. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, he's pushing carbon chain, you know, carbon taxes, gun control. It's sick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they it's a, a cultural shame. They want you to think owning a gun makes you a white racist Southerner. You know, there I go out to these open carry rallies. Yeah, there's a lot of white people there, but you also have black people. You also have women. It's not just a white male. Do you feel thing. welcome there? Oh, yeah. And, you know, most of the people I know, whether it's Grisham or uh, Justin, the other open carry guys, a lot of them are white. And, you know, I've never felt out of place or. You know, In fact, you're friends than, with a lot of folks. We can yeah. go out and do stuff. Yeah. I, I don't look at what color you are. You don't either. But that's what these socialists do. The truth is, Jakari, we're liberals in the Thomas Jefferson sense. We want freedom for everybody. We hang out with whoever we want. We're not mm -hmm. looking at skin color. The controlled left, all they've got is race now. And they're invoking all these white races to come out of the woodwork. We know they've got bots spamming Infowars with racist garbage from both sides to get us all fighting with each other. We've got to stop it. I want to talk about a perfect storm today. And the perfect storm I'm going to discuss is a really good perfect storm. I have prayed, literally, to be able to find a high quality gun sponsor that is affordable and that is extremely well made and effective that I can promote to my audience. About six months ago, we get contacted by Head Down Firearms, hdfirearms.com. Low cost compared to competitors. Super high quality, super lightweight, super accurate, and the experts salivate over it and love it. Their entire line of 556, 308, and their accessories are simply amazing. And it's designed by battle hardened vets that know what they wish they would have had. You need to go to hdfirearms.com today, or you can visit headdownproducts.com. That's headdownproducts.com. Treasonous members of the House, like Ways and Means Committee Chair Paul Ryan, attached a very popular retirement package bill for firefighters and police to the ominous TPA bill to ram it through the House. The unpopular TAA that even saw staunch TPA supporter Texas Congressman Pete Sessions saying no was not attached on this round. 
the TPA passed the House with a vote of 218 to 208. Rich Tucker of Breitbart writes, The House action is unusual. Representative Paul Ryan needed to gut a previous bill that has passed the House and Senate and then insert Obamatrade into it. It's actually a very similar process to how Obamacare passed the House. Paul Ryan argued that TPA would allow people to see what is in the TPP legislation 60 days before it would be sent to a yes or no vote essentially nullifying Congress. You see, it's like playing Russian roulette with our founding principles as they will be transferred to a supranational corporocratic world government via the now rampant corporate structure of Congress. The extremely unpopular TPA bill, as viewed by the American people, now heads back to the Senate where it will likely pass next week, according to Mitch McConnell. Why are people so upset? NAFTA went into effect January 1st, 1994. In its 20-year history, NAFTA eliminated at least 1 million U.S. jobs. A cancerous trade deficit between Mexico and Canada grew to $181 billion. Income inequality grew to new heights, and corporations benefited $360 million as NAFTA compromised domestic public interest policies. In 2000, President Bill Clinton argued that allowing China into the World Trade Organization would support hundreds of thousands of U.S. jobs and that our economy would grow as a result. After China came into the WTO, the U.S. trade deficit with China increased to $240 billion and eliminated 3.2 million U.S. jobs. Chorus K-O-R-U-S, the Korea Free Trade Agreement, signed in 2012, saw 1 billion of U.S. exports going to Korea. However, the imports increased to 13 billion, increasing the trade deficit by 12 billion and killing 75,000 U.S. jobs in the process. Obama is claiming he will need the re-engineered TAA bill to pass in the House to sign the fast track into effect. But we've all heard this one before, and after being lied to by this president more times than I can count, Obama will likely sign the TPA, TAA, or not. If all that comes to the president's desk is trade promotion authority without that additional uh, assistance for displaced workers, would he veto that bill? Well, if there is a strategy that is put in place that only allows uh, TPA to pass, that's a strategy that the president won't support. That's significant because but, but I'm not asking what strategy supports. I'm asking whether he would veto a bill. Would he veto trade promotion authority? And what, I'm saying, and what I'm trying to convey is that I don't think it's going to come to that. It won't come to that. And the reason that it won't come to that is that the strategy that the president will back uh, is a strategy that will provide a clear path for both TPA and TAA to come to his desk. Coincidentally, all eyes are on the overnight church shooting tragedy in Charleston, South Carolina, which had a clear effect on the mood in the House as they somberly cast their votes, while the TPA quietly makes its way to Obama's desk. It doesn't happen it's not in true. other places with this kind of frequency. Nope, not with guns, but with baseball bats and knives, higher. And it is in our power to do something about it. England has three times the violent crime rate in the U.S. I say that recognizing the politics in this town uh, foreclose a lot of those avenues right now. But it'd be wrong for us not to acknowledge it. Within hours of it happening, and at some nine point dead, the president is out addressing it to hype it. Come to grips with it. Yeah, come to grips with you giving weapons to al-Qaeda in, in, in Libya and Syria and Egypt to kill hundreds of thousands? President Obama is weeks away from getting down to the business of supranational warfare, dismantling our country in the name of Wall Street, expanded pollution, telecom monopolies, and pharmaceutical companies. Plain and simple, after last week's brief victory, we are once again teetering on the precipice of allowing a corrupt, bought and paid for House and Senate to toss our rights, prosperity, and constitution into the dustbin of history. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now that Jeb Bush and Donald Trump have officially announced that they will each be running for president in 2016. I wonder what the Republican primary would look like if it were held today. Well, if you watch Fox News, it might look something like this. There's Jeb right out of the starting gate at the front of the line, followed by Carson, Huckabee, Rubio, Walker, and the rest. A total of 10 candidates shown there. Again, this is from Fox News. 
But I notice someone is missing. I mean, where the hell is Rand Paul? The source of the poll clearly indicates Rand Paul in the polling and even features Rand in the official headline. And here it is, five leaders in the 2016 Republican White House race. Quinnipiac University National Poll finds Rubio, Paul are only Republicans even close to Clinton. However, according to Fox News, Rand Paul didn't even register enough to be included in their graphic. And this wasn't an accident. I mean, they did the same thing in a poll that they conducted themselves last month to see which candidates matched up best against Hillary Clinton. Rand Paul wasn't included in that poll either. Here's another Fox News graphic from an NBC Wall Street Journal poll. And you see, once again, Jeb Bush up there on top. But wait a minute. Look at the poll numbers. Rand Paul, 44%. They stuck him there at the bottom, even though he outperformed the rest. I mean, he won, yet they threw him there at the bottom. So Fox News up to their old tricks again. And this is some serious deja vu because remember, it wasn't that long ago when they pulled the same dirty tricks on Ron Paul, my president. We're looking at Mitt Romney, who continues to be the front runner, but we have Rick Perry as well, and now Michelle Bachman. Let's not count out John Huntsman, though. Now live, right next to the bus behind us, Ron Paul is speaking, and seven of the candidates are here today. We have live pictures of Ron Paul, but you know what? We're talking about Sarah Palin, we're talking about Rick Perry, the two people not in the race yet, Drew. And guess what, Paul? If you get video of Sarah Palin or get a soundbite from her, bring that back to us. You can hold the Ron Paul stuff. <laughs> we have a top tier. It is Mitt Romney, Rick Perry, and Michelle Bachman. We have a new top tier, and it's Perry, Mitt Romney, and Bachman. There's now a top tier in this race, at least for now, of Romney, Perry, and Bachman. I mean, I think that's fair to say. Really fair to say? You're not forgetting, I don't know, anyone, say, an ideologically consistent 12-term congressman who came within less than 200 votes of winning the straw poll? Isn't anyone going to give that gentleman a little love? There's a top tier now of, of, of Bachman and Perry and Romney, and, you know, we haven't mentioned, and we should... Thank you. We haven't mentioned, and we should, Rick Santorum, who did really surprisingly well for the amount of money and resources he had. Rick Santorum? He didn't get half of what Ron Paul got. Well, you see there, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Now it's Rand Paul who's experiencing the media blackout. And it's not just Fox News. I mean, it's the other networks as well. And, you know, what's the big deal? Why Rand Paul? Why the media blackout? Well, for starters, it's the 28 pages. Rand Paul has joined the fight to get the federal government to release the missing 28 pages of the official 9-11 commission report. And that was blocked and kept secret by the Bush administration. And that's because they know full well that the documents will prove once and for all that the Saudi Arabian government was directly involved in the attacks on September 11th. So very embarrassing, not to mention treasonous, by George Bush and Dick Cheney, who are both implicated here in a massive cover-up. And remember, it was George W. Bush himself, the hypocrite, who had this to say about anyone harboring terrorists. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Oh, is that right, Georgie? It's going to be like that, huh? You're either with us or you are with the terrorists. Well, you're the one, George W., who vacations with the Saudi royal family. And you're also the one who used to vacation with the Bin Laden family. And you're also going to find yourself in prison if these documents ever see the light of day. This is sort of shocking when you read it. As I read it, and we all had our own experience, I had to stop every couple pages and just sort of absorb and try to rearrange my understanding of history for the past uh, 13 years and the years leading up to that. It, it challenges you to rethink everything. And so uh, I think the whole country needs to go through that. That's right. These brave gentlemen have seen the 28 pages and they want the documents released. 
And you heard Representative Thomas Massey say right there that it will challenge you to rethink everything. Whatever is in those documents is going to change world history. I want those documents declassified. I'm embarrassed to be associated with a work product that is secret. But wait, there's more. Former Senator Bob Graham, who also co-chaired the joint Senate House investigation into the September 11th attacks, he says, I am convinced that there was a direct line between at least some of the terrorists who carried out the September 11th attacks and the government of Saudi Arabia. He called it a smoking gun. And he went on to say, the reason for this cover-up goes right up to the White House. Meanwhile, here's what they are saying in the New York Post. The Saudis deny any role in 9-11, but the CIA in one memo reportedly found incontrovertible evidence that Saudi government officials, not just wealthy Saudi hardliners, but high-level diplomats and intelligence officers employed by the kingdom helped the hijackers both financially and logistically. And if the Saudi government did indeed help finance and train the hijackers, well, that, my friends, that is an act of war. And I'm so glad to see the truth finally beginning to surface. Senator Rand Paul has just introduced legislation called the Transparency for the Families of 9-11 Act. And that would force the Obama administration to release the 28 pages. Over a decade ago, a bipartisan congressional committee investigated the 9-11 attacks and wrote a report. 28 pages from that report have never been released to the public. We're here today to call for the release of those 28 pages. The survivors, civilian heroes, and families of the victims of September 11 terrorist attacks, some of whom are here today, deserve the full truth. We cannot let page after page of blanked out documents be obscured behind a veil, leading these families to wonder if there is additional information surrounding these horrible acts. So there you have it. Rand Paul thinks that we all have the right and that the 9-11 victims' families have the right to see what's in those documents, no matter how embarrassing or how incriminating it might be to George W. Bush. So what do you say there, W? Why don't you let us see what's in those 28 pages? After all, you've got nothing to hide, right? I mean, either you are with us or you are with the terrorists.